Hi, hi. Hello. 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 Welcome. Hello. Hey. Make sure everyone's on. Okay. Let's sick. All right. Okay. We're here. Welcome to the 18th NSCHA Global Women's Forum. So we'll just keep this. Okay, so we're going to start out with the exercises and a bump. So, if you can stand, do so. If not, that's okay. <clears throat> do a little mini clearing. And we're going to do five. Okay, now I'm going to do the bump and approximately 12 inches apart. Mm. Okay, anyone not feeling it, let me know. Uh. Feeling it or not? All right, good. I'm going to increase that energy. Feel that increase going on. Let me know if you don't feel it. Okay, very good. Now we're going to take that and do our containment. Three as usual. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And as we know, that's to clear the forum, clear your space. And I'm going to do a push out just to push more of it, uh, anything that's in there lingering. Push it out of your space. Starting this A, we're going to start off uh, where we left off on uh, Rick and Ralph. Rick's, or was it Breaks the Internet? Yes, Ralph okay. Breaks the Internet. Okay. So uh, we can start off if anyone has a question, or we can just go right into it. Yeah, if anyone has questions before we get started. And again, feel free. I know some of you are a little timid about. Uh, just asking questions while we're in the middle of the, re of the review, but this is primarily for you to be able to ask questions. So don't worry if, you, if a question comes up and you feel like it's something that you might, you know, forget in a few minutes or whatever, just chime on in. Uh, you know, I, we won't take offense to it. That is what I want you to do. Okay? Good. All right. So we're at the point where Sonic the Hedgehog is explaining what Wi-Fi is to Ralph. And Ralph kind of like ignores him. And when when we were watching the movie, she was um, observing and commenting about why Ralph would want to ignore what Sonic was saying about Wi-Fi. Yeah, and uh, you did take some notes uh, because it was a couple of weeks ago that uh, there are individuals who don't want to uh, acknowledge change when change is going on around them. They're very comfortable in their little space, in their little slot. And of course, I, I think uh, when I was talking about it uh, uh, during the last forum, the, uh, the West Coast forum, that's akin to sticking your head in the sand, you know, and, or just going into denial even, but sticking your head in the sand because you just don't want to see what's really coming. So um, I think what the uh, 
also with that particular uh, scene, there was the uh, the surge protector character. Who, I, yeah, you can go ahead with that. Okay. And so, um, should I also read about the comment that you shared um, initially you get as well? So can yeah, you can go ahead. Some, okay. you know, uh, so many things, uh, working on so many things, some of the stuff that slipped my mind. So um, this is going to refresh my mind uh, as to what I was talking about at the time. So Chief says, people who are happy, that happy in being ignorant about certain things because it makes them comfortable. So they stop listening to anyone who shares with them something that isn't in their little box of what they're interested in. Or something, they don't want to listen to anything that has to do with something that would change their routine mm -hmm. or threaten their routine. So, yes, we can. Oh, addressing because uh, generally, when uh, folks get in a lock into, uh, I guess, a routine or a habit, those routines and habits are always very, very shaky, because everything does change in spite of how how hard you want to grasp onto something. So there are folks who have routines and they don't like change, but in essence, even their physicality is changing over time, over the usual time. So. Someone uh, gets into a certain routine when they're 20, and they keep with this routine. They're, they feel comfortable, but a lot of times they have to fight to actually, you know, maintain that routine. But the world does keep moving anyway. Um, and I think there's an antidote. Uh, years ago, uh, in my business, a lot of things were done very manual, it was, uh, just you know, hands-on with everything certain arch, uh, archaic types of machines were used, and then personal computers started to become popular. And they were doing more work on it, so they became more useful. Because uh, I got involved with, uh, with personal computers back in the, I'd say, the, the mid-80s, mid to early 80s, through a, a friend who was uh, writing for PC Magazine at the time, and doing articles for PC Magazine. And he just happened to need help and doing research and testing computers, uh, primarily for, for uh, you know, uh, commercial artists and illustrators. So there were other friends uh, moving further on to the future when they became uh, a bit more um, easier to use. I thought that maybe I was behind the curve. So I decided, uh, due to some other friends of mine who had agencies and so on, and they had computerized their agencies. And I just figured, well, you know, I, I don't want to be behind. So I invested in uh, personal computers for my business and then started doing certain things, found that, yeah, it was a learning curve. But in the end, once I learned these things, it made things a lot easier for me. And as a matter of fact, the funny thing about it is that I was uh, doing work for a lot of large car uh, corporations. <clears throat> and then I'm wanting to send things to them artwork via the internet. And that was when the internet had that, you know, that modem that made all that weird noise and so on. And I found that I was ahead of the curve with the larger, you know, uh, companies that I was working for. I said, you know, I can, I can send you a digital copy of, you know, of whatever I'm doing. Oh, uh, could you just send it FedEx like before, you know, just send the, you know, the actual artwork, the actual boards FedEx. And then a few years later, uh, all these companies were doing digital. So I had a, another friend who was in the business as well, and he complained like nobody's business because he put all this energy into his technique, his manual technique, and in, in, in doing you know and doing his work. And I uh, likened it to uh, some musicians that I knew way back then, who uh, said you know live music is the only way. You know, uh, composing music live and hands-on and all this stuff is the only way. And there were some others who were, you know, pioneers who said, no, I'm going to use a computer. And it's akin to individuals um, when the Model T way back in the early 1900s or whatever came into uh, being, you know, the, the first automobile. And they had the same argument there. There are people, this can never take the place of a horse and buggy. And they were sticking to the guns and they're marching around. They even had like computers marching around. Computers are dangerous and so on and so forth. I said, I don't know. The world is dangerous, but this is where the world is going. So I'm going to join in 
so that I'm not left in the cold or I have to play catch up all of a sudden. So it's like uh, someone who wants to hang on to their horse and buggy when the Model T came in. Then, of course, then everyone was driving Model T. And then, you know, something else comes in. And then, this, you know, the same group who doesn't like change, literally, excuse me, literally like record Ralph. So everything's just fine. You know, I put the blinders on, everything's just fine until it isn't. And then all they can do is whine and complain. So what he was doing with, with uh, Vanellope was literally trying to keep her in the space so he would have company. But actually, they never really, um, to tell you the truth, that whole arcade was stuck. And they never you know, uh, covered that, the reality that the whole arcade was literally not far from uh, where Rick Ralph was. So anyway, with that, we go into uh, where the, the power strip. Yes, um, also, you, you gave a note that just uh, confirmed what you were saying, where people like to stick their heads in the sand, which doesn't stop the change, and they from coming. It doesn't stop the change from coming. So mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't know what the Wi-Fi is, and they're in denial about the change because they're desperate to not see what's new or what what else is going to happen. So then the search protector says, um, Wi-Fi, they should call it DiFi. It is new, it is different, therefore you should fear it. Yeah, so therefore you should fear it, yeah. And what, one of the things I was, uh, when I first started, uh, with what I was saying earlier, has to do with the reality that if you're organic, you're going to change. So if you're 20 and you're doing the same thing for 20 years, the next thing you're 40, trying to do the same thing, and you know how fast, just even how uh, when technology really, really kicked in, how fast things shifted. So I remember vinyl, you know, and the only thing that keeps vinyl alive, I think is people may still be doing scratch for, you know, for, for rap or something or hip hop. But I had my whole collection of vinyl, which you know, I don't know if you've ever carried a, a, a box of freaking vinyls, like weighs a ton. And then they went to CDs. And then there was all this protest. It's always, like I said last, uh, you know, during the last uh, first part of the review, that the majority is racket, racket route. They don't want change. You know? <laughs> so, I was going to say, so then there were CDs came in and uh, there was the protest. Oh, CDs aren't. The sound isn't warm, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, vinyl's warm. <laughs> then those who were advocates for CDs said, "Oh yeah, right. You know the difference between the sound of of uh, of, of vinyl and CDs." And he took some plastic and said, that "That's the difference." So again, all to say that from CDs, then it moved to another form, and then to what now, you know, digital, just straight up digital. So again, everything changes, regardless as to how hard you try to hang on to routine or a situation, or we talked about individuals who, uh, their romantic dinner where they decide that they're into each other in a certain way and it's really, really working, and then they're together, they get married and whatever, and it seems to be going downhill by design in this realm. So we got to capture the past, and of course, They'll go back to, depending on how long they've been married, they'll go back to that restaurant to try to catch a moment. Usually there's somebody's like, later, 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 but they'll go, oh, please, please, and they'll go, okay, fine, let's go and see if we can reconnect. But their energy and their mind is in a totally different place also. But they go back there, and sometimes the place isn't there anymore. Or it's still there, there's different employees. There are restaurants when I lived in, uh, lived in New York City that, you know, five years, a lot of things change in five years. So there was a guy when, well, this, um, one of our favorite Vietnamese restaurants at the time, and we hit it off with the owner, and we brought a lot of clients there, you know, uh, and, you know, and they got a lot more business, and he was really, really nice. He'd give us free, you know, dishes and things like that. <laughs> but one uh, we one year we came back after we were, had moved out of the city, and his brother was there, and not him. And his brother was a whole different 
ball of wax. So he was, you know, he didn't even realize that we had actually helped, or that I had actually helped, you know, the, the business. But next thing you know, it wasn't the same atmosphere either, either to me at the play. So again, it's all about everything changes. There's so many different examples that I can I can bring up, but we, you know, we should just move on, uh, you know, with the review. But you know, you get the gist. I hope. So with the search protector, he says something that is very much um, a, a fear-based comment. Mm -hmm. And then, so you, you're you already introduced to him as that's a part of his character. So then the next thing that they usually do with these characters, they'll like have that character that said something um, that's programming or emotional-based or that supports density. Then they'll have them say something's practical. So you're not, you're kind of thrown off as to whether okay, they said something that you shouldn't um, agree with. You said, oh, they said something that you, sh you know, vice versa. And it says here, <laughs> it says here that um, she was saying that people who have a paranoia, where paranoia is normal, they're taught that, oh, people usually act like this. Like if a child was walking, watching Ralph, Ralph Briggs' the internet, and they see, like a little kid sees this guy say, that things that are new, things that are different, should be feared. It just comes. It just adds on to the pile of programming that they already have. Yeah, it's basically a campaign against uh, stability. So um, it's expected that people are going to have these different sides to them. But a lot of times it's an extreme. So some will uh, just oh, just fluff it off as well. That's just the way so and so is. You know. Uh, he's just having, or she's just having a bad day. But the reality is that, you know, their attachments are affecting them. So again, everything here has, you know, does not talk about what I talk about, what neo-traumatism is about, having to do with all these things externally that are also internally that are affecting the balance of a person. So when uh, they did something very similar uh, on uh, Black Panther, which uh, again, you, you know, the, you know, they're totally not allowing any boosting of that, which tells you that there's something up about that, something up about that. Why they're so animate about not allowing me to, to boost that? Because I kind of got in there and discovered what their plot is and was. So anyway, uh, I went off uh, for a second. Please pull me back. So um, then the search protector says something again to affirm the fear. He mm -hmm. says, here's my advice. Be afraid. Get to work. Which yeah. is so dense <laughs> Yeah. Well, again, you know, we talk about fear, which is something that's not natural. It's an introduction of unity and intensity. Uh, it's very inter interferes with everything. So, again, uh, it interferes with the concept of balance. Um, there are individuals that you may run across who seem to be very, very stable, and that's balance. But because of those who are contaminated by the, the programming, they will look at there's something wrong with the person who's constantly at an even keel. Mm -hmm. Whenever you meet them, they're always chill, they're always cool, they're always thoughtful. Sums up about it. Or, you know, their, whatever their density, wants to think that that person is weak because they are balanced. It takes a lot of strength to be balanced in this world, I'm telling you. So if you look at someone who's always in the balance, and not an act, mind you, because I can read through an act. If you look at someone's eyes moving around and they're pretending to be cute, uh, cool, or someone who's always up, that's not balance. But an even keel, where they can move this way or that way, just very comfortably, and keep themselves from going crazy, that's balance. But someone will say, well, hmm, you know, again, this person must be weak because they didn't just lose their mind when they push the button that says, lose your mind, like that. Mm -hmm. So all of this, uh, well, say, uh, yeah, all of it really, having to do with uh, the introduction of fear. And there's a study uh, years and years ago when I was uh, minoring in psychology, that the mindset of one individual is more balanced than the mindset of a mob. So they talk about mob mentality, 
It means that somebody can just set it off. Usually there's something dense in there wanting that essence will set it off and it'll you know, just like move like a wave throughout the whole crowd. And then next thing you know, you got to ride on your neck. So one person walking into a situation that something happens who's more balanced, they will be more thoughtful and I think about what's going on, what would be the best approach for me and how will I deal with this? I really certain uh, very uh, strenuous neighborhoods that I had to go through at times when I was, uh, it was in college and even after, I would go alone <clears throat> opposed to going in with a group. Or, and I call a group, uh, sometimes just one other person can actually solve the problem. But if there's you know, three of us, there's always going to be some issues. Because one of them is going to react in a way that's going to cause problems for everyone. So I would always move through places alone. And I was safer when I moved alone than when I moved with a group, even a small group. So uh, we talked about some sayings in the last forum, but I'll, I'll bring this one up so I can shoot it down, safety in numbers. You're safer alone because you are not influenced by the mindset of the group. So if something in your mind says run, you're not going to have somebody say, oh, you coward, you punk, you coward. No, I'm surviving. So again, anyway, we can move forward with that. Oh, right, you have a story. Miss yeah, I would say yes. Um, Miss A has an antidote okay. as well. So, so uh, when she was saying that it's better for you to be singular than in a mob or in a group because you are subject to the opinions of everyone in your in that group. Mm -hmm. um, when churches are large groups, and <laughs> so when I was in the in the church cult, there was this one time where I was just standing outside in the parking lot, and I was talking to um, one of oh sorry talking to one of the few people in the church cult that I could get along with a little bit or for enough and um, she she didn't treat me really really horrible like the rest of the people in the church so all of a sudden this big group of church people come out and they start yelling at her and telling her that she's a hoe that she's a prostitute that she um, what, cheated on her husband she's got like six kids and and then she, they were like starting. Well, the, the part is that the, that the husband was tuning up these people in the church, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, he was standing. He, yeah, he he was standing up. He tuned them up, brought them out, and then he just stood there quietly while these people just started acting like buzzards. Yeah, so it's like group mentality. Mm. Uh, and they're already damaged by you know by the um, uh, the kind of things that they're taught you know, in, in that cult, but it's like a group mentality. He tunes them up <clears throat> and then comes out and as, as, you know, good little robots, they came out and as you were saying. Oh, and then I was like, I, I was watching this. I kind of couldn't believe what I was looking at. I was like, what is going on? And I had, I known this um, woman for quite a while. And so I just, I, I just said, you have no proof. You have no proof. Stop this right now! You go inside, and then they all just like, 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 like they were a robotic, and they had like a remote control. They stopped, and they like turned all like in a group, like a school of freaking fish, and like turned and went back into the church. I was like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Like the children of the forest, yeah. something like a horror movie or something. Yeah. So yeah, so that's another example. This is, there's many examples, and I'm quite sure you have uh, with this. You might might spark some memories that you might have of something like that having to do with a group moving this way and moving that way and so on and so forth. One of the things that you, uh, they used to do to break up marches, <clears throat> which I find to be useless anyway, it's just a feeding uh, thing, get people together and then then just feeds on them, was that they would uh, infiltrate with a cop or someone who's paid by uh, the police to uh, cause a problem. 
So everyone's peacefully marching, and there's children in there as well. And they have a cop that comes in, and this happened in New York City some years ago uh, during the, the Bush Jr. administration, and someone would break a window. And then all of a sudden, all the cops who are, who are there supposedly to keep the peace, and you know, all of a sudden they swoop in because that's their signal. And well, of course, this emotion sweeps through the whole group of marchers as well, and then there's chaos. So again, it's just another tool of feeding that uh, that, that's, that density uses to feed on, on individuals, to feed on people. Um, it's something, because uh, when I talk about energy, some folks say, I hey, think talking about energy. But you know, uh, I've been in, um, into uh, checking out a lot of folk tales and so on, like really, really old folk tales. And some having to do with crypto, which means these type of creatures that are half animal and half human or something like that, or just a big animal type of deal. And there are a number of stories that have to do with a certain uh, creature. Uh, one is the, the Kishi in, uh, in uh, Angola that is supposedly uh, a good looking young man, but he has his hair up like really big or he wears a headdress. So the Kishi is basically, um, you know, he's really like a crypto, but no one really knows because he's, you know, he's kind of got himself fixed up where he does, you know, he looks like a human and he's always, they're always good looking. So he comes into the village, <laughs> comes into the village and interacts in festivities and so on and so forth. And, and would seek out the prettiest young woman. Then he would, add, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he would, uh, you know, mack on the prettiest woman. And if he can get, you know, her uh, to, you know, be interested in him, then he would invite her to some secluded place, which is always a red flag and definitely a no-no. So if the woman would go with him, he would get her either to his uh, house where he's living or somewhere secluded. And then he would part his hair and there would be the face of a hyena, like a live hyena head. And first, he would frighten the hell out of her to eat the essence of her fear. Then after eating the essence of her fear, then he would rip her apart, kill her in the ear. But there are a number of these types of uh, fables that exist from all different cultures around the globe. We talk about feeding on essence, energy, they know what they're doing. And they show it to you in fables and other things, and even in, you know, their sci-fi, but you say, ah, it's just a sci-fi, you know, it's not real. But they're always showing you things that they're doing. So the eating of essence is very, very real. And you know it's real as a, you know, when you go into a place and you find yourself drained. Chief, I had a question. So, is watching scary movies feeding density? Watching Even if scary you're at movies, home. Yeah, watching scary movies at home is that a program that causes you to open up doors. And they that have been, you know, uh, born and sensitive, I would watch this stuff because you know everyone else is watching this stuff, and lo and behold. After you watch it, usually at night, you go to bed, and all of a sudden you're kind of like feeling something, which means you're opening yourself up by watching scary movies. And something comes in and feeds on your fear. We're going to do uh, the review on Monster Inc. and it'll cover that. But yes, you're opening yourself up to feeding. Okay, and I don't know awesome. how many of you have ever, oh yes, go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying I'm excited for the Monsters, Inc. review. That's okay. a really good one. But I don't know how many of you have ever uh, at periods where um, even when you're a kid, even as an adult, you, you go to bed and you wrap those covers around and there's a little hole for you to breathe out of. You'd be amazed how many people have done that. Because there's actually something, because you don't have the protection at that time, something coming in in your space and you feel it overnight, you know, night after night after night sometimes. Sometimes there's a period where there's nothing coming in and you don't feel as, you know, so, you know, inclined to wrap yourself up like that. But <clears throat> my family members, there's uh, seven kids in the family. Uh, we never talked about it until we became adults 
And then turned out everybody in the family has done that. Where, we're, you know, we're family sensitive, have done that. Where you feel something, and next thing you know, as though these covers are going to protect you, you know, I, I just don't want to see it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. Good one. Um, so, you were talking about how Ralph was saying, oh, you know, Penelope, why do you want a new, you know, a new life or, you know, why do you want to change when you you have these choices? You can go to Tappers with me, or you can go play in the Tron game with me, or you can watch the sunset with me, or you can hang out, you know, at my pad with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's all about me. So, you know, that's, you know, that's literally that what goes along with that is a control element. He's giving her choices. He doesn't care about her choices. It's like uh, the government gives you choices. You have choices. Ah, that's a bunch of well, You don't have choices. They give you this, 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 that. And you have a selection. You have choices. No, if I have choices, I can choose from numerous things. That's not a choice. That's control under the guise of choices. So they say, well, <clears throat> I give you two things. You have a choice. You don't have a choice. Because either one of those two are going to send you down some road where you're going to get fed on. Every choice has to do with being with Ralph. <laughs> yeah. so, so those who are Ralphs out there, you know, and, and you find someone doing that and, and, and telling you, you have a good, you know, you have choices. No, you decide whether you have choices. So you look and say, isn't there something more than just green and red for me to wear? Chief, so that would be um, them trying to program people to accept only conditioned love instead of unconditional love, like when people give you choices and stuff like that. It is as it being like a toxic relationship. Yes, yeah, so like in a relationship. Yeah, I was saying a it's a form of like toxic. Yeah, they're trying to convince you. There are those, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've been around long enough to have had, you know, uh, a number of relationships, and. The person who's doing the most feeding a lot of times will try to, you know, tell you that there's no one who's going to be better for you than in them. <clears throat> so it's like Ralph doesn't want her to go out and seek something new because the reality of the matter is she will find something better or just different. But generally better. So when the person starts, you know, telling you that, Oh, I, I, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, loaded word, I love you, because that's why I don't like that word, because they use it as a means to manipulate. I love you. You know, no one will love you like I love you. So they throw love, 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 love all around because they're part of the feeding. So if someone is feeding on you, guess what? They're feeding something else that's feeding through them. So that's the system also. We can get into, you know, I talk about it, but, you know, we'll get into it, you know, uh, with future uh, forums as well. And, and Chief, there should, you thought, I think, please correct me, because there should be a condition as to your relationship with someone. Do they, do they show you respect and consideration for your time? Do they show you respect and consideration for your space? Do they show you respect and consideration for your thoughts? those kinds of things. And that is your, the condition on which you have a relationship. There should never be unconditional anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, usually a density will come in, and I've experienced this, where uh, you just had enough of being fed on. And for me, there was a period in my, in, in my uh, experience here where I felt like if I didn't leave the situation, I would die. And they tried all the tricks to love you and all this, and nobody will ever, even some say no one will ever care about you, you know, like I do, and so on and so on. And then they'll go back to this one, well, you never loved me for who I am. And, and it's like a mind bender. It's like, well, I guess I am nothing. You know, it's all about that person. Because they're behaving badly, but I'm supposed to accept it like I'm nothing. If it's like what Ms. A said, a balanced situation, that person should be considerate of what's going on with you also. 
instead of what's going on with them, them telling you, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's good in your life and what's bad in your life. And a lot of folks have uh, parents who do that. You know? Um, like, for example, the parental units that I had, I, I would tell them, you know, I, I really don't like the church people that we have to see every day. I feel like that they are really mean, they, that they, you know, try to hurt me. And, you know, like, like, you know, bloody knuckle games, all kinds of weird shit that squeezing my hands and stuff. And the parental units would say things like, well, at least you have food. Or when the brother unit tried to complain about going to church, they threw him in the closet and left him in there and said he can't come out until he decides he wants to go to church. So I took that as a sign, like, I better not do that. Yeah, and, it, it, you know, said decide, which wasn't a decision mm -hmm. until he... <laughs> You know, acquiesce to what they want. So I can, you know, I can talk loads about what's going on with this corona nonsense. Right. You have choices. Now. You have choices, but they keep bullying you mm -hmm. and limiting your, your, trying to limit your freedom to force you into, oh, it's your choice to take the, the vaccine now, isn't it? No, it's you bullying me into taking the vaccine. It goes right across the board. Everything is interconnected in this world. Government to Ralph. <laughs> yeah, the government to Ralph also. <laughs> um, so, and so she, so he's saying, you know what? You already have three, you know, you already have choices. Why, why do you want so something else? And he's like, fine, you know, I'll make you a trap, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it to where you'll be happy, and then you'll give me the credit. Mm -hmm. And so he goes into her game, Sugar Rush. And he makes a janky ass track, and then that's how the game gets broken. Yeah. And um, so that she was talking about people who who are inside of a group, like maybe in a cult, or even those who have been in prison. They have there so many, so few choices or no choices at all that when they come out, it's so overwhelming that they want to go back in mm -hmm. because they're so used to not thinking. Yes, another version of people going to the military, where you really <coughs> sign your life away, and they get to do with you whatever they want to, and you have no say so. So if you, they want you to do something that's extremely dangerous, that the, the outcome will be you dead. If you go against it, you know they will throw you in the stockade or something, or a dishonorable discharge or whatever. So you know, in other words. Uh, Thinking for oneself is not allowed. Same thing in the prison. Thinking for oneself is not allowed. A lot of nasty things that go on in there has to do with the, the feeding of essence. So, you know, uh, young men going in there are not protected by the system that puts them in there. So they try to get into a gang or something that has its own hierarchy. So it's just this madness that's going on that has to do with uh, literally just locking a person down. And you're talking about, there's uh, a, a, a Shawshank uh, Redemption, I believe, uh, was one movie uh, with Morgan Freeman and uh, I forgot what the other uh, actor, the, the main character, where um, Morgan Freeman's character was in prison for so long and when he finally got out, he could not behave like when he was in prison. So he was uh, got a little job uh, packing bags, uh, packing you know uh, groceries at a grocery store, uh, and the uh, the, the uh, supervisor would come by and uh, tell him, okay, I want you to go over and do some stackings over there. And he go, yes, boss, yes, boss. And the and the you know and the superintendent's like, hey, man, you know, chill out, you know, this isn't this is an enslavement period. <laughs> but because he was conditioned to behave that way, he had a hard time breaking it. And there are individuals who uh, have been in and they end up going back because the system, you know, thought for them. Or there was a hierarchy set up and, you know, and original thinking was not allowed. So even when I was in college and I knew a lot of guys who were in Vietnam, there are a number of stories about guys who came back home after being in the jungle for three years and every day they could be their last day, and 
they get back into so-called uh, civilized society and they couldn't handle it. And the number number of re ah what do you call it? anyway uh, I forgot what it's called but anyway they went back in and to get sent back over because they felt more comfortable in the jungle uh, in that mode that they had been programmed into where they were always on edge. And some were just insane to the point where they just liked killing people too. So it comes in, you know, genteel society, you can't just walk up with it, you know, uh, with your weapon and just start mowing people down. Or if somebody pisses you off, you can't just, you know, you know, kill them. So he went somewhere where he could take that out. Excuse <laughs> me. Sorry. And a number of young men who had gone uh, during a desert storm had the same issues. Because they were programmed to kill. Once it, uh, his commanding officer said, okay, I want you guys to go. Nobody comes back without killing somebody. So the number of civilians that were murdered during that time was pretty high. They were killing people who didn't even have weapons. So again, it's part of that system. And it's part of programming. As, as we were talking about. Okay, so we're going to get back into... Okay. So Vanellope, like you said, is a minority, and she asks Ralph, don't you wish something new and different would happen in your game? And, um, well, he said, like, he, he doesn't... He said no. And then she said, well, let's agree to disagree. And she's because she's trying to let go of the argument. She doesn't want to have an altercation or anything because Ralph is very stubborn, and she knows that. And... But Ralph wants her to conform, so he, he starts con trying to continue the argument, trying to, tr well, trying to aggravate it. Yeah, did he say something like, oh, yeah. we're having an argument? Yeah. Something like that. We're arguing, you know, and he's like, Yeah, like, like are we arguing? Because he just figured his will was right. What he wanted was right. If she uh, protested, uh, you know, there's something wrong with it. Why would you protest? Yes, because... Yeah. Because uh, she even explains to him, agree to disagree is just a way to say we don't have to argue about it. Yeah, we don't have to agree on everything. You know, I can have my own way of thinking. And this is, no, you can't. Literally. And just like you said, that density is always trying to get you to be impulsive. So as soon as he thinks that they're arguing, he runs out and tries to make the new track, which causes more problems mm -hmm. for her. Yeah, it's also like to prove his point. And uh, like Miss A was saying, it's like a snap decision. He doesn't plan anything. He just goes out and just starts digging stuff up and creates this really screwed up track. And while he's trying to be the hero, he ends up um, making everyone in that whole game homeless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Okay. <laughs> and, um, well, that's how Venice City works. They, they're always shooting themselves in the foot. They're always causing a bigger problem by trying to so-called solve a problem. And but it's really interesting. She always talks about how sometimes it's the, your perspective on a situation, and if you look at things correctly, everything can be a lesson. So yeah. even <coughs> excuse me. So even though Ralph fucked up the game and made everyone homeless, it allowed Penelope to have an experience where mm -hmm. that she could explore something new. Therefore, he shot himself in the foot. Yes. So she had no choice but to. <clears throat> you know, in other words, uh, the whole idea was to, to get that, that part, that steering wheel, to the game. So they had to take a journey because of, uh, I think, the price of the thing cost more than the machine. Uh, you know, so they had to figure out how to get this wheel back so that they could get the, the machine working. So Ralph, in the end, could get his way with, uh, with Vanellope, where she won't, you know, won't be, won't leave. Okay. So, again... Density is always shooting themselves in the foot. If you pay attention, you can see the opportunities in their goof ups. Mm -hmm. You were saying, Chief, that sometimes there's like people who want to leave a neighborhood or they want to leave their partner, and the 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 partner that is the Ralph will put in like a new deck or a new pool just to try to keep them from leaving. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, buy a whole bunch of material things, but when the reality it has to do with that person's energy and that person's personality, that, that's the problem. But they'll find something external. Uh, hey, you know, or guy, I'll buy you a new car. You know, that'll fix it, but it goes deeper than material objects. Or I'll buy you a house. So you know, even if the person falls for it for a while, it's not going to last because the problem goes deeper than 
material stuff. And even when Ralph, you know, fucks up the game, uh, Sugar Rush, <clears throat> he's happier. He's happier because now he can keep his fetish, Vanellope, closer to him. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about himself, even though she's having kind of like a life crisis. She, all he can say is, do you want a fort year or the obvious best choice of Higgly? So do you want this, my choice, or my other choice? Yeah, right. They can, you know, now they can be camping buddies or yes. something. Yeah. You know, she, he's, yeah, she can live in his game. Which means, you know, for him, wow, you know, that's even better. She'll live in my game. And he said something about, isn't our friendship enough? And she had to be honest, and she said it isn't. Because he's feeding on her. Yeah. Like and she... that part of her, you know, if you were saying if they were real people, that's that part of a person's higher consciousness that feels that, that sucking of their energy going and their life being drained out of them. Like um, her... She has a, um, the, t the only type of feeding that she does is that she is a tease, but he's immune to the teasing, so he's feeding more. He's the bigger feeder. Yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, like his don't. density <laughs> doesn't really allow her to feed him, but yeah, she no, does, no, no. yeah, she just calls him whatever, all these yeah, like goofy these. names or whatever, but it's like, oh, yeah, really, 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 you know, it's like something that bounces off his head or bounces off his back, and, you know, because he's such a program. He can't feel what she's doing, or when she's trying to feed back a little bit. And um, that's a he, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, you know, but, oh, I, uh, I thought someone was something about no. the video or something. Okay. No, that's and then the he doesn't. It's like he's he. She's the only one in that arcade that is patient enough to put up with him, and. No one else treats him as good as him. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's another problem someone uh, will run into if they're actually a patient kind of individual and will put up with someone who's actually a problematic individual. Uh, if it's in a real uh, sense, it may have to be with, uh, do with a person who grew up in a environment where maybe one of the parents was like a girl. So they had to be patient with that person. So they used, <clears throat> sorry, to being patient with someone who's like that. Yeah. And also she, like, also someone, would you say, someone who came from a worse environment than being with, what she felt was a worse environment than being with Ralph. Because before she was ostracized and picked on by everyone in right. the whole game. Mm -hmm. And so she, um, then whenever everything um, went down, she ended up uh, hanging out with Ralph because he was there. Right. And so they had that moment, you know, where uh, things worked out. Uh, I think, you know, um, he was saying that he saved her, but you were reflecting back on the first one that literally she saved him, right? Yeah, she saved end. him back. <laughs> but he, yeah, she saved him back. Yeah. So again, it's like that uh, recapturing a moment. And he wants to live in that moment where all of a sudden he feels like, the, you know, uh, I think there's uh, this hero thing that yes. he's wearing around, you know, where he was a hero. And that moment's passed. And things change. And those are individuals, again, who don't like change. They want to live in the moment, then he wants to go back, and everything's different. You were saying that eventually Penelope has enough of Ralph, and then Ralph, you know, Ralph, if he's like a person, oh, I'm sorry, but, and then they expect that to be good enough for you to stay as their little captor. Yeah, I'm quite sure a lot of people, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the sorry or the uh, forgiveness. Uh, button. You know, so, oh, I'm sorry, that should be enough. Okay, we're good, we're good, all right. But <clears throat> first said, no, sorry doesn't do it, it doesn't fix everything. It's, so sorry is connected to that forgive me, because ones who generally who are asking forgiveness, most of the time, but not all the time, are the ones who are screwing up all the time. It's like, I'm sorry, won't you still be my captive? You know, that kind of attitude. Yeah, yeah. Come on, crawl back into the prison. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then so Vanelfi's saying, what do I do now that I don't have a game? And then he's like, oh, it'll be great. You can sleep in. There's no work. And then we can go to Tappers every night. And you literally just describe paradise. And it's all about Ralph. Yeah, and... yeah literally. That was the, the <laughs> that's what the other says. You know, he's describing paradise. And his paradise 
is nothing like what, you know, and I don't think she's even looking for paradise. She's looking for more adventure. She's looking for something more interesting. She's looking to expand her expression and her experiences. And uh, whether someone's looking for paradise, which is, I would say, kind of loaded as well, because what is paradise really? It's, it depends on what that person considers to be paradise. So for him, yeah, sleeping in, not having to work, not doing anything. There are people who like to be active. There are people who like to do things. And she's someone who likes to do things. But he wants, again, it's control and manipulation and selfishness. So, oh. um, so she was saying to Ralph, which is interesting, I, I like the way that uh, Disney Pixar, uh, or Disney, uh, did the explain her character because she's saying that she doesn't know what's next and the fear of not knowing what's next the uncertainty fear of uncertainty was like eating her up mm -hmm. and she's she identifies as being a racer so she says if i'm not a racer then what am i yeah which is a program itself you know i define myself by what i do so that's another issue defining yourself by what you do uh you know there's a lot of uh, situations you deal with uh, have situations where there's <clears throat> so-called a lot of professionals and certain individuals uh, would uh, like someone says well I'm a doctor turn on and you say I'm a doctor and then all this opinion from those who are programmed ooh doctor doctor you don't give a crap if he's a good doctor or not he's a doctor or I'm a lawyer, and there's a lot of jokes about people that hate lawyers or whatever, but there's also this part, lawyers can make money, they can make money. So that's considered, was considered, especially when I was, uh, was uh, growing up, a, a really good choice as a career. So she's identifying herself as a racer, and, uh, you know, if I'm not a racer, what am I? So I don't know if any of you have ever changed your vocation. I have. Where what I was doing, I got to a certain point, and it, and recently I had to realize that even though I was successful at it, I got to a point where I hated it. So I needed something else, more, more, kind of like a vanilla. I needed something else to make it worth my time being here. But I had a lot of things that I was interesting uh, in, which was cool. You know, I didn't have anyone trying to lock me down. But also, a lot of the things I was interested in, I kept to myself. And when I decided to try something different, oh, you know, the record Ralph's come out of the woodwork. You know, no, you're an artist. You're, you know, you should just be interested in from doing, going from commercial art to fine art. That's what, that's what artists do. They go to fine art. You know, are you doing your own art? I said, no, man. I spent, geez, decades at a board doing artwork. You think being a commercial artist is not an artist? I'm not being creative? It's a creative field. But there's the mindset. There was a lot of artists within it that felt like they were uh, lowly because they were doing commercial art instead of uh, some program of what an artist is uh, you know, in commercial art, you find shortcuts in, in, in uh, problem solving because you have deadlines. And someone said, oh, okay, um, how did you paint this painting? Because I was doing my own fine art, but it wasn't like I was aspiring to be in some gallery somewhere. It's just that what I enjoyed and what I enjoyed doing when I was a kid. I said, yeah, well, this one, I used the, uh, the projector and I projected the image onto the paper. And I said, oh, yeah. Like, I'm supposed to with a thumb and, you know, it's all has to do with programming. So programming themselves as to what they are. And then again, if you decide to go outside of that, then all these, you know, all these drones come and they jump on you and try to keep you from expanding and going off in a different direction. And a lot of times they're feeding on you. That's why they don't want you to go off in a different uh, direction. If you go off in a different direction, you start to meet different people. You start to find yourself in a different environment. And also, you find yourself in a different head. So when you find yourself in a different head, those who are feeding on you that you weren't aware of, 
all of a sudden you realize, damn, I guess I had a lot of fears going on because there's a lot of this going on. But I'm stubborn that way, and I just went on and did what I wanted to do anyway. So. So you were uh, saying that many people, even if they want change, they only want change a little, not too much change. Yeah, there are folks who, yeah, uh, I will change the branch, uh, store from uh, the branch in New York to the branch in Ohio. Same company. I want change. Yeah, it's kind of change. You know, you live in a different, you know, state. But is that really change? But again, it's, people are free to do whatever the hell they want to do. But I don't consider that change for myself. And what it's about is the freedom to choose what kind of change you want without all of the, you know, the, the, the noise from the peanut gallery or from the feeders. You, you taught us that the first thing to be able to accept more change is to change your mind first. And you gave, you gave a few uh, mantras, which we have posts of on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I am of supreme consciousness, therefore I have worth, always have, always will. I release the past and embrace the future. So those things are um, that she gives, uh, um, that he taught us are to help you to break through the, the blockages that are in your energy, in your mind. Well, you were talking about before the, uh, uh, today's forum that you wanted to uh, bring up the meme that uh, we sure. posted, uh, I guess it was last week or something. I have it. And it has, you know, those of you who saw it, you know, know what we're talking about. Yeah. Should I read it out loud? Yeah, you can read it out loud. Sure. So it's um, it says the system convinces those that it abuses to fear change, as though there can be something worse than the hell they are already experiencing. The system defines to those who want change what change should look like. The system trains you to keep yourself in prison. Can you say Stockholm syndrome? True yeah, so, logic. Yeah. By the chief. <laughs> right. So, you know, that goes along with what we're talking about with the record route. Everything that we're talking about uh, today, that goes along with it. So, um, we're going to uh, from the theater. Okay. So, you were talking about Stockholm Syndrome. So, literally, Ralph is trying to teach Vanellope that it's good to be my captor. I yeah. mean, my captive. It's good to be my captive. <clears throat> yeah. It's good to be. Uh, you know, stuck to my side as my fetish. Because of her affection for him, she struggles with that. So it is a bit of uh, her fighting a Stockholm syndrome. In other words, I um, I have uh, more respect for this person who is locking me down than I have for myself. Mm -hmm. But she's struggling with her own self-respect. Okay, so we get to this point where she's struggling with the self-respect that has to do with the limited experience, but still, it's still an experience beyond where she's been. So uh, as we go on with the, you know, with the story and those who've seen it, you know what happened anyway. But we can move to the next, uh, next scene. Um, that you were, this, the next scene that comes up, you have referenced it. It was about, you're my best friend. And then she's like, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about how when someone wants to row their own boat, but then someone's trying to like hold on to their boat. Yeah, yeah, it happens a lot with uh, with a lot of parents and in, in their in their uh, in the children. Mm. I think I even talked about some of that, so I'm not going to re uh, repeat what I talked about in the, um, the first um, uh, uh, the first part of the review. Yeah. So so then she says, I can't remember if she says this or is this just the vibe, but she's almost like sorry. I know I'm, she said, I'm sorry, I know I'm being weird, but when she's not being weird. Well, that, again, you know, if a person's being very balanced or being very nice, uh, they're being weird because, oh, you're opening yourself up to, you know, to uh, hyenas, they're going to, you know, rip you apart. So. And, but that's how, like, Ralph would paint every everything else that she wants to do. Ralph painted Shank as the hyena when he was feeding on her. He just yeah. didn't want to share his food. Right. <laughs> Um, so she says, I'm sorry, I know I'm being weird, but she's just, she's trying to say, um, it's almost like she's sorry for not seeing things the way he does. 
Yeah, and it's kind of trying to like stroke him a bit. You know, I, you know, I want this. I really do want this, but I know I'm being weird. But inside, I really do want this. I'm just saying I'm being weird so that you don't feel like, you know, uh, I'm agreeing with you in some way. But in the back of her mind, cleverly, no, nah, I don't think that's weird. I want to do this, but in order to get you to shut the hell up, I'll just, oh, yeah, 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 maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just being strange. And that's why, that's how I see that. Because there, you know, there are those who had, had very, very overbearing individuals who are coming down on them and calling them this. Yeah, I might be weird. Yeah, maybe I'm weird. And then you go back in, because that person's not a mind reader. You go back into your own space. Okay, let's continue my escape plan. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, Chief, he has a really great sense of humor. But where I grew up and the family units that I had, every time I tried to tell a joke, no one would laugh and they would make fun of me. But when I met Chief and I met his daughter, they were the first people to ever, like, really encourage me to try to make a joke or try to be funny and it would felt really like a relief so sometimes I want to tell a joke so badly but I'm so like like clogged up that I almost like want to cry and then it ruins the moment and I'm like oh shit <laughs> you know you know what I said also about you know uh, telling jokes uh, you know, my jokes don't always hit the you know, hit the, the mark but I don't care you know <laughs> You know, just like, wow, that one missed the mark. Maybe I'll tweak it a little bit. So you figure out how to tweak certain things. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, want to be a stand-up comedian or anything like that. But it's about not being afraid to actually put yourself out there. Because as long as it's not something where you're doing something ridiculous, like tightrope walking without a net or something, <laughs> you know, where you can just permanently injure yourself. But something that's very simple about having thoughts. Uh, the father unit, when he was a kid, he uh, liked to build things. And I forgot how old he was. He's pretty young. When he decided he was going to build his own airplane, which was already <laughs> a dangerous you know, mindset, but he was being creative. So he, he puts this thing together, and somehow gets it on the top of the house. And, of course, it doesn't fly. He just goes off and he crashes into the ground. And from that point on, he was considered the crazy one in the family. Just for trying. Reality, he was very, very creative, but because he grew up and he had a very large family, like 11 kids in that family, who were, you know, it's like a mob telling you, you're crazy, you're the crazy one, you're the crazy one. And at some point, you might start to believe it, but also he had uh, some stubbornness to him, and he would continue to build things. There were some things that he actually had invented when I was in my early teens. <clears throat> but he didn't have confidence in what he was building because he's a crazy one. And later on, he would work these jobs of uh, construction and demolition to carry this, this uh, something called a, it's like a, a bulldozer. He had this little small bulldozer, and he built this trailer, and he had this thing where it wouldn't rock back and forth. He didn't have to put tons of chains to keep it on the freaking bed. My uh, oldest, the oldest sister said, you know what? They, they laughed at him about it, and about 10 years later, those are standard, that design. And we're not so sure if they didn't get it from him. But because they were beating him down, he didn't go and promote it and do better <clears throat> for himself financially because of these individuals who have no force, have no creativity, beating down someone who does have creativity. Okay? So after... Um, Vanellope realizes that Ralph has no sensitivity to what she's going through. She's like, I just want to be alone. And it's, it's, I don't care if I share this story where I'm going to speak in my own. Yeah. Your I know. <laughs> I just, I have respect for you, you too. <laughs> yeah, I have respect for you too. So, that's... <laughs> so I was like, I was at the beach. I was at the beach once with the relatives and um, the the ant unit that I have had, she is like a demon-like character, and the mother unit, she's like a goblin, ghoul-like character, and so is the sister, she's like a ghoul-like character, so they're very parasitic on my energy. And I could handle the sister unit a lot better than I could handle the demon-like ant and the goblin-ghoul-like mother unit. So we had two separate little bungalows, and it was I, I was able to like contain the bungalow that I was in, I contained the sister unit, I, I contained myself, and I was like 
talking to the sister unit to like calm her energy down and stop it from like totally feeding on me. And I, I was, it was very nice. And I was actually able to like have a breather away from the other uh, relatives. And they suddenly decided to change our location, put us in a hostel where it smelled like piss and put us in the same room where I had to endure the demon ant snoring all night. And then, then that night I, I was being fed on so much that I just went out in the middle of the night and walked on the street and just sat there and tried to like recuperate my energy. And then, then the next day or that evening as well, they, they wanted to go to the beach and I was just like, leave me alone, leave me alone. You know, I'm like get out of here. And I made them leave. And I just laid there on the beach and I was just trying to like help myself. And they acted like I was a weirdo for wanting to be alone. And they tried to make fun of me for wanting to be alone. And so even when Vanellope says, I want to be alone, he still says, let's go to, Ta Ta I'll see you at Tapras tonight. You know, just so much in consideration, no respect and consideration for how you're feeling. And if that's what a family is, is, is supposed to be, um, forget family. <laughs> Sorry, well, they're basically, again, uh, you know, family is, is just another word uh, that's used to, to kind of lock you into individuals who more than likely who are feeding on you. And even individuals who are problematic, uh, you'll get involved in things with someone that you, you know is a problem and you really want to wipe their hands of it. And it's not uh, unheard of that there are individuals who just own family members because they've had enough. So uh, what Ms. A was uh, dealing with was getting to that point where she was having enough of this nonsense, which is basically being fed off. So again, um, I'm, you know, I, I, I've said it in a, in a number of, of, of forums having to do with the, the loaded words and so on. But again, everyone is just separate consciousness, really. So <clears throat> if you dive with a, a consciousness that's not supposed to be in your genetic group or your family, or your gender, and so on and so forth, then you jive with that person. If you're uh, someone who's fully in the family, who you, it was just a problem to you, and there are people who just have family members who just hate them, but you have to be considered. This family is blood, blood, blood is bigger than one. Uh, bunch of nonsense. Oh. You know, it's all an illusion. What's important is how you vibrate with one another. That's what's important. Because there are many people, and some family members who have gotten family members killed who come to their aid because they're a problem. So again, uh, with, you know, with the whole concept of family, uh, it's a touchy, you know, it's really a touchy one. And I know that folks have the program that you have to, you know, if you don't have them, you have nothing. It's another fear thing. Again, I like it when I'm, when I was running around alone. I like having Ms. A because we job. You know, we get along. But when I was alone, when I finally, uh, you know, in the, my, uh, going with my family had issues, but nothing to the extent of some of the others that I've had it as clients. But I still needed my space. I still needed to branch out and move from one part, uh, side of the country in, in the United States to the other side. And it was interesting. I, uh, I think I had gotten through concepts of fear because my desire to be successful at what I wanted to do outweighed the fear, and I did well leaving that environment. So again, it's more important to be comfortable with yourself, and if you walk around with fear, it's just like what I was told when I was a kid, you know, animals feel, you know, smell the fear on you. Yes, they do, and so do people. So when I'm walking through and I'm casual I'm, uh, and I'm just comfortable with myself, I had a friend, uh, we're, we're, we look kind of similar, like we could be you know, related, and uh, you know, we're both fit, but he really got into it, and we're walking you know, in Midtown, going to the movies, you know, check out a movie together, and he's walking like this. And I'm walking like this. And guys will pass, and if anyone they look at, they look at him. Because me, I was so comfortable that my energy wasn't telegraphing my fear. Or telegraphing fear, because I didn't have it. It was telegraphing fear. 
And after, you know, after a while, he says, you know, I wish I could be as relaxed as you are. So again, uh, you know, a lot of it has you know, involves fear, uh, the whole family thing of sticking with people because they, you know, you'll, you'll have no one if you don't have family, you'll have no one. Um, in the neo semantic frame of things, you have a lot of company that's out there that's willing to help you. If you're willing to do the things that you need to do to create the balance so that they can help you. Okay, so we can move. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, you, so it goes on to the next scene, where it's about where all the racers, you know, they're, they're pretty, a lot of them have this kind of asshole personality. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of like the Western, uh, it, it comes from something that, you know, that's been imported to all over the planet that, yeah. you know, to, to be, uh, you know, you got to be like snarky and, yeah, you know, yeah. tough and you got to so say all kinds of insulting things it. and then that proves that you're a badass and so on and so forth. Uh, to tell you the truth, certain people who pretend to be badasses are more afraid of the person who's calm and quiet. It doesn't get them affected. I mean, <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. They're more afraid of that, I guarantee you. So this is just a, you know, uh, something to seal in a program where little kids are watching this. But of course, this is something that you know, adults, because we're all adults here, except for one, who have uh, probably watched this and find certain things entertaining about it, but not reading between the lines and not understanding that they're shoring up programming. So it's, accept it's acceptable to have the bad boys of sports or the bad boys or the bad girls of this and the bad, you know, this is something that was really promoted, uh, I would say late 70s and the 80s, the bad boys, you know. And, uh, you know, I think there was a story I talked about with Dwayne Johnson where he was, uh, he wanted to be the good guy wrestler and nobody liked him when he was a good guy. And then he's just like, the hell with this. And he started calling people names and so on and so forth. And then they're like, yes, that's what we want. You know, it's insanity. It's just, programming is insanity. You know, up is down, down is up. Um, you were teaching us, Chief, that balance, true, true balance, because in my opinion, what Chief teaches is true balance because whenever you go and look at it on in New Age or you look at it on Instagram, you'll never get the real thing, real deal. And that is a weapon against density. Humor, balanced humor is a weapon against density, and calm is a weapon against density. <clears throat> and density, you see it everywhere in all its forms. And that's what this movie reviews are about: breaking it down, and showing you the program that you can use your calm to fight. You can use your bal uh, the balance that she teaches you and also humor to fight back. <laughs> yeah, and generally the things that are trying to attack you with other people, someone who's aggressive, is the things that control them. That's why I will talk to you guys as clients. If you're going to contain, contain, you contain them, but make sure you're containing everything that's around them and that's connected to them. When you really, really get good at it, you don't even have to contain that person. You'll see the thing and boom, you hit that. And all of a sudden, that person's personality just changes. Someone's coming towards you in a certain way, and then all of a sudden, you, and this has happened, all of a sudden, they go off this way. Chief um, was teaching me that I don't, I take things, I've been, I was trained to te take things way too seriously. So the, the fact that I didn't have a, a developed sense of humor, it contributed to me just taking everything so seriously. Like whenever I wanted to get Chief some tea, and it took me like 25 minutes. And then I come back and I'm like, this is why, this is what I did. And I, I'm this many minutes late. And, and she's like, whoa, whoa. And then he tracked it all the way back to the relatives and the grandmother unit acting like everything that I needed to do should have been done yesterday, like an impossibility. And taking things too serious can really, um, you, have, um, you have a quote on Instagram and on Facebook about not taking things so seriously. Okay, uh, I don't know if you have that Probably, one accessible. Yeah, I do have it accessible. Um, I think there was uh, several people who liked who liked the post. I can find it. That's what you were saying before while you're looking at it. Yes, uh, thank you food. very much. Uh, but uh, if you can re recap because when you, you, uh, you talked about the post, then I kind of forgot what I was going to say. Okay, uh, well, I have the post here. Okay, you found it. Okay, great. Okay. 
In the end, everything we say, do, see, and feel becomes nothing more than a footnote in the illusion of time. So relax. That's the one that I, I took for, like, not taking everything so seriously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of the time, that, you know, that kind of behavior is a controlled behavior also. If, uh, you know, uh, you know, give me a drink or she's off to give me tea, I said, okay, fine, cool. And she comes back 25 minutes later, I never say, where have you been? Because <laughs> I've got other things that I'm into as well. And I say, oh, I'll come eventually. But it's not life-threatening. It's not like, you know, go get my, uh, you know, it's, those who have this, this attachment of, you know, uh, asthma or whatever, go get my inhaler. <laughs> then she goes 25 minutes okay. later, she comes back, I, you know, and I'm dead. So it's not anything, you know, it's, it's there's nothing that freaking serious, you know, in this world. Nothing that you should really take that serious in this world. And again, it's all about throwing, you know, fear, the fear of the unknown, what might happen tomorrow, and, and so on and so forth. And creating worry. Again, uh, those of you who know what I say about worry, there's nothing really to worry about. You know, you can, uh, well, let's say, they're, they're saying, I said, there's, there's a million things you can worry about, but there's really nothing to worry about. Because worry is not going to stop something that's coming, you know. And if you're into what I'm doing properly, you realize that you can control, after a while, how things move forward. You don't have to know exactly where all the players are going to be, but you can know how the energy, what kind of energy you want on your path. And being calm and tuning in to your empathic abilities as they're rising, that's when learning, those who, uh, uh, who have had their empathic abilities awakened uh, through sessions, it's about utilizing that as a, also a barometer in many things. You can impact on uh, how and who you need to contain first in a situation, or what you need to contain first. So when I'm moving forward, there's always someone that's going to try to come from the side, you know, lines and say, worry about tomorrow. Or, you know, the news says there's a war in Syria. Ah! And I said, well, why would I worry about that? I'll deal with it if it comes here. And ten times out of ten, it never reaches me. It's funny. The mother unit in, um, was trying to tell me that there was a war in Syria. And I'm like, what does that have to do with me? What can I do about that? <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah. But it's also looking at things in a balanced way, even when someone's, oh, you know, the whales are dying. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, there's like a path to follow that has nothing to do with Greenpeace, because I believe it's a dense entity group. That means thinking something's being taken care of. But, you know, I've been around long enough to know how long that's been around. And they'll still talk about these particular issues or whatever. Or if they decide that they want to, like, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're effectively uh, dealing with it, but you don't know if they're effectively dealing with anything. They want you to take their word for it. Um, we, we did some research, and, you know, they were promoting global warming, global warming. But before, it used to be global cooling, but they weren't getting enough essence from that, so they changed it to global warming, which more people freak out about. <laughs> yeah, they were talking about uh, water levels, you know, rising, ocean levels rising. And I said, they're still trying to hit the global warming thing, but then we did a research uh, research that in areas, the, the uh, water levels in the ocean are dropping to the point where in Alexandria, Egypt, ruins are starting to be exposed because the water levels <laughs> are dropping in the ocean. So ruins that are under the water are starting to be exposed. So again, that has to do with not taking everything for face value. And I even say, when I talk about certain things, if you can research it, research it. Because I don't care, man. I know what I'm talking about. And you'll find something, but there's certain things that you're not able to, it has to do with my personal understanding. But the, I say the, um, the what happens or the uh, effects of what I am doing 
in what I'm doing for you, what I'm talking about, you weigh the effects. That's how you find out what I'm saying is true or not. Just like in the last form, uh, it's not about <coughs> faith in supreme consciousness, it's about experiencing supreme consciousness. Yeah, experiencing. <coughs> and then don't expect to experience the same thing that everyone else has experienced. We had some individuals who wanted sessions, and then one person, who I think might have been just messing with this person, had a really intense uh, empathic experience. Because apparently her energy wasn't as locked down as this other person. So she goes and, and plays the imp and just tells this person, I had this really wonderful experience and so on and so forth. But this other person literally just asked questions all the way through. And I'm trying to work, but she's got another question. Okay, I've got work. Then she's got another question. Okay. So why did I have an experience like so and so? And, and they weren't even questions that were like really um, genuine questions of, they, I want to change this, Chief. How do I change this? Or I'm struggling with this. Can you teach me? It was just questions that kind of weigh her knowledge. Or something. Yes. Yeah, we talked. I talked about that. The uh, you know uh, one of the other uh, forum. It was like weighing. <clears throat> excuse me. Trying to weigh their knowledge against mine. I said, Why are you here? I I don't have time for this. It's a competition. It's not a competition. What I do, nobody knows. What I do. I am the only one who knows what I do. And there are periods where I'm walking into uncharted waters, but I have a sense of where I'm going. <coughs> they don't. You don't. I know where I'm going, but you don't. And these individuals come in, and they want to weigh some new age garbage that's been around for hell of all. They want to weigh some shit that doesn't work with what I do. Say, come in. This is new. This is not anything you know. This is not anything you've ever experienced. It's new. Get it through your thick head. And I'll tell them that, and it's still trying to do this new age crap. Sorry, I'm getting, you know, and this is something that really gets to me sometimes. <laughs> like, people bug me, really. They do. A lot of people just bug the hell out of me. <laughs> and that's why I kick people out of my practice. Because they're bugging me. They don't want to learn anything. They don't want to control me or they want to want me to like stroke them and tell them that they're doing okay while they got their head in the toilet. No, your head's not in the toilet. You know, it's just fine. That's a, this is a new type of hat. That's really what it is. Like anyway, let's move. You were saying you um, enjoy uh, having sessions with younger clients because they really want to learn. Yeah, they haven't been so damaged yet mm -hmm. and got so insecure that, you know, every time they, you know, they make a move, they want to be sure that, you know, I'm making the right move. Uh, you know, kids, you know, younger people are like, tell me what's up, man. You know, you're the sage. Tell me, sage, what's up? I said, cool, proper approach. I'll tell you what's up. And then they go out and do as you ask, and then they get. And results. they always have better results. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always, a hundred percent. I get a hundred percent success, even from the ones who are difficult. But it takes a bit longer because they're always fighting. Or lying. Or lying. <laughs> or Big telling time. half the truth. Yeah, or not telling you the full, you know, story. Like, you know, I, I get the, you know, I to spend my time walking around in their world, you know, doing a, a, you know, a treasure hunt or some kind of deal. I got a lot of clients. I don't have time to be just sitting in people's, you know, tell me what's up. Come clean. It'll help you. I'm not going to use it against you. I haven't used it against anybody in years ever. I will use some examples, but I won't, you know, I won't name you. But it usually has to do with a learning process. So I'll, I'll talk about how someone has, uh, you know, in other words, tried to uh, skirt or skirt what I'm doing that goes works against them. But I won't tell, you know, won't talk about a person's name. They don't know each other. But it's about examples to help others understand where not to go and how not to behave if you want real help. Chief, I will say my life has gotten so much better with the tools that you've given me and just having sessions with you. So I just want to say I'm, I'm really appreciative for you and Miss A. Even your music, I listen to it all the time. It always makes me feel better. When, like, and I appreciate it. And you're one of the young ones. <laughs> 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 so kudos to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So we could, uh, yeah, go on. Since I finished my rant, anyway. So. Well, 
Well, yeah, you were talking about um, how a lot of times people don't fully understand how much you are charting a new course and, you know, just blazing the trail. And like I, there was a forum that I did when I was doing the women's forums by myself. And I said that the chief is the tip of the spear, that he is the movement that is piercing through the freaking density so that we, I can be free, so that those who will follow him can be free. And that is my opinion of this movement, of the NSCHA movement. And when Chief was saying, you can't be afraid of the future because fear won't help you face what's coming in the future. <laughs> well, you were saying about charting courses. You know, it's, it's pretty much they talk about social chartered course, social chartered course. But I'm charting a course, but I have these like, no, you can't be charting a course. Well, who said that the ones that they're lobbying, which is density, tells you who's charting a course? It's so programmed that you believe someone else can chart a course, but you can never meet someone face to face who's charting a new course. Think about that. Well, we don't have a crown on their head. <laughs> right, we don't have a crown on my head. <laughs> or look at the castle. The, the, the cat from the system, you know, who, who will promote. I mean, if they're promoting somebody big time, you better believe they're dense as shit. Or they just sold their soul. Or, or <laughs> they sold their soul and they're dense as shit. So anyway. <laughs> so um, going on to the next scene, there's like all these little crazy children and they're like running amok in, in the house of uh, Ralph's friend, a sort of friend. Yeah, one of the other. Yeah, yeah one, one of his other. In the game, yeah, yeah, one of the other game, game participants. Yeah, or, game or, or NPCs or whatever. Um, yeah, they're just, they're like just another game character in mm -hmm. his game. And these kids are just running among, and running among, excuse me, and they, the, these char this character, he has hooked up with another character from a different game. I forget mm -hmm. their names, but um, they're saying that when you have, when you have children, it's about something that you just be impulsive about, and you just jump in it with both feet. <laughs> well, that's before they actually uh, had yeah, adopted the kids, right? <laughs> yeah, he had some, you know, half-baked idea. Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, I think back in the 70s was Dr. Spock. I don't know if anybody remembers that guy. And uh, not from Star Trek, but the guy who wrote a book on uh, child care. And <laughs> the mother unit was like, this is rich. Uh, people have been raising children for who knows how long. And probably badly, especially uh, once this density showed up. But this guy, who's obviously dense, writes a book on how to take, you know, how to raise children, and he got a lot of publicity, a lot of publicity, a lot of publicity behind it. And folks were following it. You know, these folks are looking for these self-help books and whatever. Someone to tell me something that I should really be able to sense and figure out for myself. It has to do with logic, true logic. I call not BS logic, like numbers. Numbers are logic. None of this crap. I'm talking about true logic, literally. So anyway, a number of years go by, and we're like coming our know that that is rightfully so. The guy, uh, his kids grow up, uh, problems with drug addiction and a bunch of other nonsensical things. And someone said, "Well, where did you go wrong?" You know, and all of a sudden, hush, hush. He's not mentioned anymore. But the system of density wanted people to follow this guy into the toilet. And all these people reading his book followed his ass into the toilet. Uh, a lot of the stuff, since we never really read it, just, you know, some er excerpts from it, which I just went, ah, you know, just nonsense. But this is what goes on. They're always, this is well, part of what you're saying about change, and the system tells you what change is. So they choose somebody, and they, you know, and they put their hands up, they're like, okay, this is a new guy here, or this is a new woman here in the follow. It's all about Disney. It's just promoted too much. And you know, like what May said, you just sold your soul, and you are dense as crap. But you're a machine for essence. Again, the cryptozoological creatures that go after the essence of a victim before they kill. Also, um, Chief, you were saying that uh, very rarely there are those who have some energy to them or some light energy to them, and they go into the into the business wide-eyed and 
where she failed and unknowing. And the, the media will promote them, promote them, and just drag their energy into the, into the abyss. Yeah, there are some individuals you might see start out and they seem very, very real and raw with the talent and so on, and just the humor. And when the system gets hold of them, all of a sudden you kind of feel like they're getting stilted. Or they're, you know, what they were before is getting compressed into a small box, which means the system wants to control their creativity. Because they don't want too much creativity because it gets out of hand and that energy gets so you know, large and, and, and wild that it's either unpalatable for them or they just can't control the masses the way that they were controlling them before. So they'll take someone who's very, very talented and then have everyone focus on that person or those people. And then those folks just kind of come in line. And also, when these folks uh, are given deals, they have to sell their souls for them. Then. So they can get that kind of promotion. Uh, you know, how does a person get to be a billionaire? That's what's still you know, you know, interesting thing to me. They always say hard work. <laughs> oh, that bootstrap crap is yes. just a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> There's no such thing as bootstrap anything. That's to do with whether the system supports you or not. Because there's plenty of really you know, uh, talented people out there who don't get any play. That's another thing uh, to add to the list of calm, balanced humor, and balanced, um, you know, balance it, true balance itself. But mm -hmm. also creativity is a weapon to fight density, too. <coughs> yeah. That's why density always wants to, like you said, control it or minimize it or mm -hmm. um, contaminate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's interesting you were saying, Chief, that it, it's um, Sergeant Calhoun and Fix-It Felix. Those are the two parents. And you mm -hmm. said in, in, in this realm, if that were the case, if they were to just randomly adopt a bunch of children, that would mean they are <laughs> feeders yeah. who want to feed on the kids. Yeah, and, uh, I don't know how many of you ever, uh, the number of, uh, you know, I've been around long enough to have read a number of uh, things because I mean, I'm just interested in stuff. Oh, I know the things I know uh, about foster parents and kids who come from foster homes. Uh, every so often, there may be someone who comes from one that you know seems to be not that bad, but the majority of them are very, very, really bad experiences. You know, and if a kid's bouncing from one damaged uh, environment to the next, you're dealing with a very, very extremely damaged kid. And we're uh, talking about these uh, these drivers who are acting very thuggish. And, you know, oh, it'd be nice to have a child. Let me grab that little thug on the corner and make him my son or my daughter. Or my husband. Or my <laughs> husband, yeah, you know. That's going to work out really well. Because mm -hmm. those individuals are already damaged anyway. They think that you're going to control them and not acknowledging that you're damaged. So a damaged individual trying to, you know, raise another damaged individual. Yeah, and, and here's where the um, the safety search protector starts talking about things that are logical, and he's like, "You don't do this. You don't do do this impulsively. It's really a bad idea." And they're like, "Oh, it'll be fine," and all you hear is like the sounds of things breaking <laughs> inside of the house. Yeah. But um, so now they talk about like. And they also throw like a dash of religion in there, just like random. But Chief says everything is religion. Yeah, so. everything in this realm is religion. Oh, it, it is a hierarchy, and someone who's uh, totally over things, and you don't question that person, that's religion. Just because it doesn't have like Bible phrases like, oh, they're just lost little lambs, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't mean you know, it, it's, it's interesting because you're taught. To, to not trust the government on one hand, but then on the other hand, they trust it. So um, you're saying that you know, um, they tell you, okay, this is what we want you to think is religion, but we don't mm -hmm. want you to know that everything else is religion too. Yeah. And that's what that post that you made mm -hmm. was about, you know, how they, they define to you what change is. They define mm -hmm. to you what everything is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, that's okay. So if you're just keep going. I can feel I'll, I'll the disruption while I was freaking trying to talk. I'm like, I think I'm going to drop this. So oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up. Anyway. Okay. So. And I might, I might just, you know, break in with yeah, it. But no just, just go ahead, though. Um, okay. So, um, so she was 
So I think Sergeant Calhoun was, or or either her or Fix It Felix was saying, I know how you do it. You you treat your child like your best friend. You give them everything they want. You love their socks off, and it'll all be fine. And then the surge protector was like, oh, that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah, literally. And one of the things I was thinking about having to do with um, <clears throat> how when uh, Ms. Ames talking about uh, surge protectors, you know, he's telling people just be afraid, and then he's talking some actual logic about, you know, uh, you can't just, you know, just grab any random kid and start raising them. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they don't want me to do this one. No. I should not have done the intro to this, but I got it. You know, so there's, uh, we'll, I'll just go to religion, for instance. Um, where they talk about love thy brother and and by thyself, self yeah. and all of that. And which means love everybody. And go, oh yeah, love everybody. But then they get a bug up their butt. Love everybody except those guys. When reality, you know, isn't that phrase like love everyone? Even that concept of unconditional love or whatever? Love everyone, but not them. Or to make it even easier for them, uh, and that used to happen in the past uh, when people were, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, still a lot of wars going on that you don't even know about uh, in um, conflicts. That the enemy is not a human being. The enslaved is not a human being. Therefore, you can enslave them and be a pious religious person at the same time. So that's where I wanted to, you know, wanted to talk about the 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 the, uh, the contradictions mm. in this world. That's why everyone's imbalanced and the majority are crazy because you're trying to fit things together that don't fit together. They told me this, but then they're telling me this. What should I believe? Then they don't want you to think. That what makes you crazy. If you think, you said. Mm, there's like a gray area in this nonsense, and I'm going to sit and ponder it. No, don't sit and ponder it. React, react, react. That's another thing. React. You don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. Uh, you said, love thy brother as thyself. Praise God and pass the ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, if someone does something, you know, uh, to certain individuals, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah praise God and pass the ammunition. Literally. Yeah. But everyone else that you know, they, that person will do dirt to. I don't care where they're at. It's like, yeah, get over it. You lost. Get over it. Yeah. But if it's done to them. Praise God. Praise the Lord and pass that ammunition. And I'll never get over it. Yeah, like uh, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. But then holy wars, and yeah. you know, holiday. Um, in the record, no, in the Ready Player One, in a CHA movie review. That guy, the main character, his name is Halliday, and it is a reference to Holy Day, which is about war, which is about raping and pillaging and killing. All day long. All day long, and he was the maker of the game that they were praising through that, that entire movie, which is a representation of this hologram that we're living in. <laughs> Understand the words that you're using or that you're listening to. You're using words, and they come from some source, and you're not sure about them. Uh, find the origin. And it'll open your eyes. Just like um, one of the um, forms that you did, Chief, where we went through the whole definition of uh, the origins, excuse me, the origins of the word love and how it came from Rome and crucifixion and all of its hor uh, horrors. Yeah, also <clears throat> the Colosseum, <clears throat> observing people, you know, chop each other up, chop each other to death. Uh, yeah, they, you know, the the term love derived. From that period, same period as the Romantic period, where they created mm -hmm. the concept of romance. Well, I think what? when they, they punctuated romance, was, uh, I think it was in the 1800s. Same time, same time to, to, they originated the word love. Uh, but love, but there were no Colosseum stuff going on in the 1800s. Oh no, no, but that's. But that's the region in which that it comes from. But I believe that the the the, um, the beginnings of that work comes from way back during the time of the Colosseum. Isn't that correct? No, it, well, well, that's the truth. We're going to have to research this again. So, today, no, that's the true history. So you think that there's a the word with, it says whenever you look on the internet, 
that the word love was created during the same period as the romance period, right? And you, and you think that, but there's actually a history behind all the history that you can find on the internet. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the, uh, like years ago, I did the research on the romance, uh, you know, the romantic period. And, and when they point, it was during the time when romantic novels came into being. So again, you're living in an environment that is interested in feeding on your essence, so they create these things uh, like romance novels, romance movies, where a lot of single women primarily fall into this, and maybe they you know, haven't had much success. Well, you know, successful relationships are kind of, I don't know if they really exist or not, because it takes a lot of not being romantic to actually make them work. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, so <clears throat> romance novels are a bunch of hopeful individuals Longing for something that they don't have, and probably uh, you know, there's one part of them I I love to have this, but there's another part that for them that feels like I'll never have this. So again, there's this conflict going on, but they get into this, and a lot of times uh, these uh, females who are, who are reading these types of things and watching these movies, uh, a, a, a pint of Häagen Dazs seems to go along with it. So they're sitting there, and they're kind of you know certain ones. Uh, just get into a depression or a funk, or they just lock them away, themselves away into this fantasy world. Some they get into a funk and they just eat themselves until they, you know, until they're overweight, and then walk out and not ever find someone really interested in them. Mm -hmm. Except, you know, there's not, you know, there are women who, you know, have, uh, you know, are not small women. And they have relationships and so on and so forth. But again. <clears throat> this is something that creates a certain mindset and it feeds off of that mindset and certain depression that helped uh, a few clients who are into these things. And some of them lie about it. They won't tell me, but I always get the information. And I can also I can read the character of an individual and can tell you that, you know, who's doing who's into this stuff and who isn't. Uh, I think someone wants to ask a question. Yeah, Oh, uh, no, you're fine. You answered my question. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, with, with there's a definition of love is patient, love is kind. Uh, would you like me to read that? Yeah, okay. Okay. So, there's a lot of confusion. And um, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. No, this is the, that's not the religious one, is it? It is the religious one. That is the religious one. one, yeah. But it's pretty much teaching people to be a sucker and to be fed on by others. Yeah, that seemed like you might have read it one other time, too. And yeah, and you know, repetition is good, because that's how they get all this stuff going and people buying the, you know, the, the bill of goods that they want to sell you. They repeat, repeat, repeat like a mantra. Because people who have a, a more parasitic nature, they are always self-seeking. So they mm -hmm. wouldn't, they would not even listen to this. Because, you know, maybe in, in only in word would they say, "Oh, I'm not self-seeking," but you can tell by their behavior. Yeah, but these also the individuals who would dissect that and then use the part that you know you shouldn't. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, what does it say? You it's not, not easily remember. angered. Does not keep record of wrongs. <clears throat> yeah, don't keep record of all the wrongs I've done. And those individuals will, will, you know, that's why I say it's a loaded word because it's used way too much. And that, and we definitely did a uh, a percentage of, you know, of, uh, of how people use it and how uh, individuals use it to manipulate. And it's in a, uh, you know, it's one of the earlier uh, forums. So no need to go through that. It again. was in a muscle testing. Yeah, the muscle testing form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, Ms. A has all these things uh, categorized. Uh, not categorized. Well, on the um, on the, the website. Com slash FAQ. Yeah, uh, yeah, FAQ, and it'll tell you which uh, form I address these particular issues. It has here too that love is not proud, and I noticed that they love to throw that around whenever you want to defend yourself, you want to stand up for um, whatever you are doing, and then they tell you you're arrogant. That, um, uh, but it kind of, in a way, you know, uh, fits in, um, kind of loosely, uh, yeah, kind of loosely, you know, 
But we can um, go back. Yeah, we can go ahead and move on. Okay. So now Ralph is at Tapper's and he's complaining to Tapper, the um, the, the, the general, bartender. Yeah, the bartender who's mm -hmm. the, he, he always provides the you know, root beer. And he's saying that uh, Vanellope is is acting crazy or super insecure. And then Tapper is, has to tell him, you know, you're acting insecure, insecure now. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that, um, you know, give her a break. She's just had, um, she's just lost, you know, everything. So you need to be more patient. He, he can't even see that he really was the reason for the, the problem. Yeah, right. Well, that again, that uh, goes along with people who are, uh, you know, wreck and route and, and uh, self-centered. Uh, you're having a, a struggle, but they depend on you. And so they want to, well, I'm, I'm maybe getting a little bit off of that particular uh, part of the subject, but uh, if you're the one who literally is carrying the weight and then you, you're you just breaking down and you're having a hard time moving forward, uh, their experience with individuals won't get off their duff and try to help carry that weight. They just try to like, you know, pep talk you back up on your feet so that you can struggle, you know, even that much more until you fall dead. And, you know, in reality, that's also they're feeding on all those individuals. I was fed on that way, you know, myself. And to the point where at, at some point I felt that the partner was akin to a jockey who strapped a saddle on my back and had this crop and hit me in the butt. Keep going, keep going, keep going until I finally got rid of this illusion of what family is supposed to be in marriage and whipped into true logic. Do I wish to survive or do I wish to believe in some BS that is not working? Because it takes two, if you're in a, in a, in a, in a relationship, to be on at least somewhat on the same page and two, participating in, in, you know, and you don't have to be like, you know, twins doing it, but that person should do what they can to support this thing and you're doing what you can to support this thing. Instead of one like, oh man, the horse is, you know, has thrown a shoe, uh, you know, hey horse, uh, put that shoe on by yourself there and I'll just sit there and I'll direct. Mm -hmm. I won't pick up the, you know, the, the, the load and try to help you. I'll just like point out what you should do. And also there's individuals who will say things to you and, uh, and, and react to you in a certain way. And you say, you know what, I've been observing and you're, you know, you're not really interested in me as someone who you respect. You're just interested in me as someone you can use. And you thought really low of me until you realized that I'm very, very effective at what I do. And I said, but you were disrespecting me. And then that person, literally, I didn't know what I was doing back then. Or they make a mistake and they say, I didn't know what I was doing. Watch out for that shit too. That's a wreck it Ralph if you know, ever saw one or heard one. That's a self-centered individual, very dense of eating. So with that added, we can um, the relatives that I had as well, they would like volunteer me to carry other people's groceries, volunteer me to drive people around, volunteer for others to take my stuff, and um, then they wonder why I don't want to be with them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of times they get used because you're, you know, when you were, you were a kid, so you didn't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. But me, it was about patience and trying to actually, I want to be sure of what's going on before I make the decision on what I'm going to do about this. So while you're being patient, they just assume that you're okay with it. So when you finally decide, oh, I've had enough, it's all of a sudden, he decided he wants to leave. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to teach him that where I am, he should be. You know, like the relative, like Ralph, he even says, you know, she doesn't know what's good for her, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't know I'm supporting him. With, you know, with lip service. <laughs> Who needs that? Like Ralph doesn't understand why Penelope doesn't want to hang out with him in this scene at Tapper's. Mm -hmm. And then he says, he says to Tapper, I don't know what her problem is. She said being my friend wasn't enough. I'm a great friend, right, Tapper? You know, like not even giving him a choice. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I had someone say, I'm a nice person out there using you. And I said, yeah, keep telling yourself that. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said, who's acting insecure now? Tapper didn't let him um, feed on him. He just turned it back on to Red. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, that part. Yeah, okay. He just turned it back on him. Like, ah, oh, who's being insecure now? You know? But they're so self-absorbed, you know, <clears throat> everyone's a bit player in their game, in their, in, you know, in their play. Until they run into someone who's more domineering than they are. But what they do, they stay away from the ones that are you know, more domineering because I want my own play and I'm going to find my own characters, my own supporting characters that I can use and feed off of. And you could tell that uh, Ralph was like hungry because usually he feeds on Vanellope. So now he's trying to feed on Tapper by asking him where Van if he's seen Vanellope every 10 seconds or if yeah, every right. 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is another way of, of yeah, feeding again. It's like little kids would do that, you know. You know, are we there now? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, like that. That's <laughs> like junior feeder learning to be a big feeder, you know, for the future. And they are, you know, it, it, it's logical what Tapper is saying, but they are kind of slipping in something that, oh, if you go to a bar, you might have a wise um, conversation or a, a wise advice from a bar. Yeah, they, well, they portray that in movies for I don't know oh, how long. Yeah, for a long, long, long time. That you know, the uh, bartender is the, uh, the I don't know how psychiatrist or whatever mm -hmm. is is the wizened one, the one who's mixing you with these alcoholic drinks that will allow you to be possessed if you drink enough of them. Open you to density. Yeah. And um, so, I've also heard of people saying that everything sounds better when you're drunk, or people are prettier when you get drunk. <laughs> Yeah. So all these kinds of, um, um, you, call, you call it glamour, like yeah. vampires, yeah. they'll look cast glamour on the film. Yeah, to make themselves look you know, uh, like something they're not. Uh, and you, there are these uh, fables about um, sirens mm. who will you know, portray themselves as a beautiful young woman <clears throat> to, to pull in a, you know, a, a young man to feed on. And that's another one about feeding on energy also, sirens. And if you read any of those things, it's also about feeding on essence. So it does exist. It is real. And when the guy, you know, she finally gets him in her clutches and ready to feed on him, I think they turn. And also, then there's a fear factor also that they can feed on. But it's, it's too late for him to, you know, to drain them dry and leave them as a dry husk, or depending on whatever the story you have to do with, with Simon. Thank you. So then, then Felix comes and he's like, oh, I need a drink. You know, like drinking is going to save his. Um, situation, I mean, help his situation. Yeah, they're talking about root beer, but you know they're talking about alcohol. And he's already depressed. It will just make him more depressed. It is a depressant. <laughs> I mean, it's actually recorded as a depressant. Mm -hmm. But folks are like, I have more fun, you know, and then the down is like, a, you can come down in a very depressive way off of alcohol. There's all kinds of, like, sayings that are training you to believe in that, like, I need a drink. Sit mm -hmm. down, take the edge off. You look like you need a drink. Liquid yeah. courage. Mm -hmm. You know, I need a shot of courage. Our happy yes. hour, even. Yeah, but I think we did cover uh, a bit of that uh, last time, so we should move on. Oh, I, I didn't recall that. Yeah, so we, somehow yeah we did cover I, a bit of that, yeah. Uh, I'm just going down the list, and, and since we have covered this uh, before, it's like uh, we jump around a lot, so I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. No, again, repetition uh, isn't harmful in this case. Okay. So, so then he finally admits that it might possibly be his fault somehow, and just <laughs> when his life was perfect. So. Yeah, yeah, it's still you know not holding up that somehow it's still really actually looking at it. Okay, did this, and I did that, and I did that. oh yeah, no, it might be, which is not owning up to it. You know, it's really not owning up to it. It's really weak. So, um, so then. So Felix, so Vanellope Vanel no, is having kind of like a stress attack where she's worried about how to find the peace and, you know, like she's not going to have a game, she's going to be homeless forever, even though doesn't know what to do. Yeah, very fatalistic. Yes, yeah, very fatalistic. Yeah. And so then um, Ralph decides, you know, we're going to go to the internet and he's, he's going there to try to be the hero again, you know, trying to get his his fetish to believe in him again so that she'll mm. stick around. Yeah, and they, they um, well, it's interesting, they did, uh, they're very 
clever they were. They, they were actually showing a lot of what I'm talking about, that his reason for doing it is a selfish reason. It's not to help her. It's literally to help his agenda, what he wants her to do. So if he gets the steering wheel, she won't be unhappy, and, you know, and he can continue to, con uh, to convince her to stick with, this, uh, with the arcade and do the same thing that she was doing before. So they, they go to eBay and they find the actual piece that they need for the game <coughs> and um, then they start sabotaging themselves by picking numbers that are like too high and they don't have any money. Yeah, and that one there, uh, they just veered off and started feeding on the audience. Because whenever I would see uh, any kind of movie where people are just being blatantly stupid, it would just make me cringe. And then I'm puffing out this essence of just like, oh, I'm embarrassed for them. I don't want to see this. And I'm puffing out essence. So anyone who has a hard time looking at someone just walking into a, you know, a, a running a plane propeller will know what I'm talking about. It really is hard to watch those types of scenes because they're ridiculously ridiculous. You know, just, yes. How often should you contain while watching a movie, like even if it's Wreck-It Ralph? Because I know there's a lot of programming even in cartoon movies. Every time you feel like <laughs> okay. you can take the movie and then you contain episodes, man. If you start to feel uncomfortable, start containing. You know, just start containing. Um, I've been doing things uh, 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 more recently having to do with loops. And anyone who uh, will have any uh, any sessions in the, uh, coming up, and those who've already had and have experienced loops, you know how it works and how it feels when I grab these loops. The things that whatever went in on in your life that makes you react a certain way when you see something, it has to do with a tape or something that might have happened to you that is very, very uncomfortable. And then the, when you watch something like that, it's like someone's coming and they're taking a big finger and then boom, punching a button right in your chest. And the next thing you know, you feel this discomfort. I, you know, I don't want to see this. I just, you know. So it's, it's basically, it's a loop that they're triggering. And I remove the loop. And when I remove the loop, uh, there's certain things having to do with, uh, you know, when I clear, people feel much lighter. It's, it's a combination of feeling even lighter, but also more clarity in your thoughts. Because all these loops clutter your energy. All these things that happened in your past run on loops. Certain things that were traumatic, even things that, you, you know, where you felt, I've never won anything before in my life, and I think I might have talked about it in the last forum. I never won anything in my life. It's a, you know, it creates a loop that has to do with, oh, what was me, what was me up until this point. <clears throat> so I have to get rid of those as well. Because it's letting go of something that you're holding on to this, I never win anything. I never win anything. I never win anything. So it allows your consciousness to get more cohesive, more solid. So, yes, uh, good question. Whenever you feel it, you can just contain every few minutes, just because it doesn't take anything to contain, just your focus. So you can watch a movie and you contain it. Say, whoa, this thing contained. While the violence contained. Whenever I watch movies by myself, I I always um, stop the video if I need to. Sometimes people feel like they can't stop it. You can't stop the movie, you know. But sometimes yeah, so you I'm gonna you know miss the flow. Yeah. But if you watch the movie and they have a rape scene or something like that, contain that. No. Like um like I said, I think in the last forum, if it has like twelve acts, I'll just contain each act of the mm. movie just in case, and then whenever I go through, sometimes something will trigger me, even though I contained it, like, uh, it was just- But it's hitting a, it's, but it's hitting it, a loop. Yes, it's hitting know. a loop, for yeah. sure. Because, like, there was this, uh, I was watching this archeological video, and there was this mound of, like, soil, and then there was this really dark circle in the middle, and then they were, like, effing around, the, whoever edited the video, and they made a face pop out of the dark. <laughs> and I was like, oh! And then my head kind of hurt, and I was like, oh my gosh, and then, I realized they hit those loops that had to do with like being afraid of something coming out of the dark and out of nowhere at me. 
Well, even watching videos on YouTube, uh, there was something we watched recently uh, having to do with the cop shooting a, a groundhog. And, uh, and this groundhog was just kind of like lost in the middle of the street and, you know, holding up traffic. So, you know, the cop comes and uh, this groundhog, out of confusion, it heads in his direction. He pulls out his gun and he shoots it dead. And, you know, we like animals. <laughs> so a loop came up. I said, I got to hit that loop, man, because I'm having a hard time with this. But it was like this loop came up, and it's like they show certain things to puff essence out into the atmosphere. Because there's always something there to gather it and, and, you know, need it and feed off it. So again, so you contain those things as well. So and if you have, when you have a session, I start doing the loop, I will create a place where you can burn them, but I have to start the fire. <laughs> So I'll start the fire, you find loops, flames still going, you keep throwing things, and you'll start to look and find all these loops. Your head will start to feel weird or whatever, but once it clears up, you'll find that there's more clarity of thought. And more energy. And more energy, yes, more energy on top of it. A lot more energy on top of it. That stuff is draining me, like yeah. all those loops of uh, things coming out of the dark at me or draining my energy, like loops of like the father unit walking in the dark in the middle of the night and me hitting him with a book because why are you walking around in the dark? And then like other things like that, just little instances where I was afraid of the dark. Yeah, but that came from other loops Yeah. where your reaction <clears throat> or someone becoming paranoid mm -hmm. over something because mm -hmm. something happened that has to do with something popping out in the dark or feeling unsafe in your own house because the parents may invite people without actually being discerning about who they're bringing into the house with their kids. So, you know, you're on edge and there's loops that build up around those things. Sometimes loops can go for like years with just no breaks. There are loops that are very short, maybe like a few seconds, then there's loops, like I said, that can go on a number of years. And just, but, we, the, but then there's loops within loops within loops within loops. You know, but the reality of the matter, it can be gotten rid of. So, you get rid of them. Yeah, 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 if I get rid of them, they, they can be gotten rid of. Um, so we are out of time. Oh, I right, think there's okay. anyone with a question. Okay, before we, we end it, anyone with any, any uh, more questions? <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. This is about. Um, thank you for making me feel comfortable asking questions. Like, it's helping me work on my public speaking. But I noticed in the movie, it's later on, but Vanellope thought she found a better life, but she's still stuck in her racer program. So it's really a false life she's living. And density is still feeding on her, even though she isn't around Ralph anymore. Yeah, in, this, in essence, yeah, she moves, you know, just kind of like parallel. But, you know, in other words, move, instead of moving really forward, well, I mean, maybe it's a little parallel, but maybe a little forward because it's a new experience in, in a lot of ways and new people that she's experiencing. Uh, you know, Slaughter Race from the name alone, you know, uh, tells you that that's not a warm and fuzzy kind of deal. And even the, uh, the, the, uh, the main character in Slaughter Race She's kind of hard edge and trying to make her, you know, like the, um, uh, the gentle thug or something like that, which kind of like is a little bit of a mind screw as well. But yeah, uh, she's still still feeding, as you know. But um, again, this one seems like we're going to have a, a third, uh, yeah, you know, other, a, you know, a third installment because there's so much stuff in this that really speaks to what goes on in this world and what goes on with people. But uh, thank you for all the really great questions. And, and again, I'm glad you feel comfortable asking them. That's what this is about, okay? She will cover that question um, in more depth. Yeah, I'll, I'll get more in, uh, in depth. And if, I, if it isn't clear enough, uh, you know, uh, the next uh, form, just, 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 you know, chime in and remind me, okay? Okay, okay everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. Okay, everyone. Thank you, for Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.